computers are revolutionizing modern warfare. And nowhere are computers more important than in aiding commanders, the Battle Brave. The roots of the modern computer are military. Battleships of the 1940s had sophisticated mechanical computing devices to control their big guns. They were still being used in the early 1990s. It's not anything like your modern computers. As a, someone would say computer, they think of something with digits, uh, uh, you know, television screens, monitors, keyboards, that sort of thing. Here we do all our computations using mechanical devices, uh, and our computer's quite large, and, but it has only one function, and that's to solve a fire control problem. You can't play any video games on it or anything like that. Another use of the early mechanical computers of World War II was to calculate the trajectories of anti-aircraft guns. Some of the earliest breakthroughs in electronic computers took place in World War II. Electronic computing machines were developed to decipher enemy codes and to help develop advanced weapons. In the years after World War II, computers continued to grow in importance. But these early computers could only perform simple mathematical tasks. They were large, slow, and cumbersome. By the 1950s, computers began to shrink in size and grow in power as large vacuum tubes were superseded by tiny transistors. Computers could now move into new environments. Simple computers helped revolutionize fighter design. F-106 Interceptor was one of the most sophisticated combat aircraft of the late 1950s. It was fitted with an advanced radar and armed with a new generation of guided missiles. It was also one of the first combat aircraft fitted with a computer. The computer coordinated the complex weapon system on board the fighter, linking the radar, missiles and fire control system. On older fighter aircraft, so complex a weapon system would have taken several crewmen. Because of the computer, the F-106 needed only a single crewman. By the 1970s, transistors were being replaced by integrated circuits, further reducing computer size and increasing computer power. The F-15 fighter of the early 1980s had 200 times the computer power of the older F-106. The added computer power helped in many areas, but none more so than in fire control. The whole business about uh, fire control is it's now so complex that the uh, man in the cockpit can't really cope. And we're talking about much longer ranges, greater speeds, greater closing distances, angles, things that, he, you know, he cannot cope with. Back in the guns days, very few people were any good. And there are very few natural shots. What this is trying to do, technology is trying to make every fighter pilot an ace. computers permitted one of the most critical innovations in aviation technology, fly-by-wire flight controls. Fly-by-wire is a computer-aided flight control system which allows the pilot to get the maximum performance out of an aircraft while preventing the pilot from slipping the aircraft into dangerous maneuvers. It has given modern fighters like the French Rafale here a degree of maneuverability undreamed of a decade ago. The flight control computers, uh, the pilot can really heave around on the stick without having to bother overstressing the airframe or getting himself out of control. And particularly at low levels, that's vital. Computers transmit the signals that the pilot's putting in to uh, a control input that, that the aircraft and the airframe can actually take given the combination of speed and altitude. Computer power on aircraft continues to grow. The new F-15E Strike Eagle has 10 times the computer power of the earlier F-15A model. This added computer power is used with the aircraft's sophisticated ground attack system. And today's newest fighters, such as the F-22 ATF, have 20 times more capacity than the F-15E and over a thousand times the capacity of early jet fighters. Yet all this computing power fits into a space not much larger than that of the early aircraft computers of the 1950s. It is computers, more than any other single technology, which has revolutionized the combat power of the modern fighter aircraft.
computer technology began to spread into land warfare in the 1950s and 1960s. Early computers were delicate machines, ill-suited to the mud, grime, and harsh temperatures of ground combat. They were first used by artillery units in much the same fashion as the old mechanical computers on board battleships. To paraphrase Homer, artillery are the gods who strike from afar. Uh, they have always been the historical king of battle. Modern artillery systems can wreak havoc from extremely long range. As a result, they require a great deal of accuracy in planning that fire. They also require computers to help process targets at very long range to allow that fire to be delivered on target. Back in the 1970s, you saw fire control computers, very basic, very large systems. Uh, an example in the field artillery is the FADAC computer. It was used to plan fires, to coordinate fires, but used very, very basic computer technology. Artillery was the branch most in need of computer power. In the past, mathematical computations were done by hand. Computers offered greater speed and greater accuracy. The ground combat that really started off with the, um, the computer in the field was field artillery, whereby whole complex um, yards and yards of calculations could be knocked out by a, a, a simple computer within s fractions of a second. And the artillery computers now are, are really down to literally handheld size. They can, you can just put in where you are, where the target is, and the computer will, will tell you which way to point the gun and all the other data you need, and even down to the type of ammunition and the, what charge you require. The brains of modern artillery units are the fire direction centers. In the U.S. Army, the fire direction center is basically a computer system mounted in an armored vehicle. Information flows into the center from higher headquarters via secure radio data links. The data are computed and the instructions are sent by radio or landline to neighboring howitzers. The miniaturization of computers is permitting the mounting of fire direction computers in each individual artillery vehicle. A good example of this is the new MLRS, Multiple Launch Rocket System. The computer is integrated with a land navigation system. This combination permits the launch vehicle to accurately aim and fire its powerful salvo of rockets entirely automatically. Computers have also spread to other branches of the Army. By hardening electronic computers to the rigors of field conditions, Compact ballistic computers were introduced on tanks in the 1970s. This was a significant advance in tank firepower and accuracy. Well, a tank needs a, com needs a computer, mainly, for fire control, because the actual guns themselves, people call them guns, I always think of more of them as surgical instruments, because they're so accurate they can literally decide whether to hit a turret or a, or a suspension at several thousand yards. But uh, the point I'm getting at is that to, to get that sort of accuracy, you require very precise fire control. And a digital computer, a computer where it's simply on off going through, they can be programmed to accept so many, so many different criteria. Long range accuracy is a critical ingredient in modern tank war. The tank that can fire first and fire accurately is usually the victor. During the Gulf War, American and British tanks emerged victorious because they could fire accurately long before their Iraqi opponents could do so. Aiming a gun at long ranges requires complex mathematical computation. First of all, a tank has to engage a target at three or four kilometers range. And in order to hit the target, a number of factors have to be taken into to account. The wind condition can have an impact on the projectile, the temperature, the speed of the tank itself, the speed of the target. So a human cannot compute all that information and lay the gun on the target. And that is where 
a computer, particularly a digital computer now, can assemble all that information and ensure the tank gunner, when he opens fire, he hits the target with a fresh round. So he kills the enemy first and doesn't waste ammunition. And really, a computer in a tank is now a heart, because many of the new tanks, like the M1A2 and the Challenger, have a data bus. And that data bus links not only the tank's fire control computer, but also the other sensors. And as we move into a vehicle with a battlefield management system, an integrated protection system, the computer will play a major role. If an anti-tank missile has come in, the computer will help you decide when and if to use your chef, your flares, or your other devices. So the computer really is the heart of the tank. Without a computer, a tank is useless. Computers are equally vital in naval warfare. Modern warships operate in a complex environment must coordinate their actions with friendly ships and friendly aircraft. They are threatened by many types of advanced weapons. Enemy aircraft can attack from unpredictable directions, firing advanced anti-ship missiles. Enemy submarines can approach unseen, launching torpedoes and missiles. The ships themselves are increasingly complex. Their radars and sonars can detect the approach of an enemy force at very long distances. Their gun systems can destroy incoming anti-ship missiles. Their missiles can destroy aircraft. But coordinating all this lethal hardware is beyond human capability alone. Computers are becoming a critical focal point in assisting the ship commander to control the warship. Think in terms of the commander trying to form a picture of what's happening and trying to act on that picture. Now, remember that any battle may cover hundreds of square miles, even thousands of square miles. Enormous numbers of things are happening. The question is, if information is flowing into wherever the commander is, how can that information be assembled into a coherent picture? Because without the coherent picture, the information is worthless, just wasted. In World War II, that information was, was collated manually. If you look at a movie of a World War II ship, for example, what you see is a plexiglass screen and men are behind it writing backwards. And what they're writing is, I've seen an airplane here. No, now we've seen it here. All right, it's going this way. We see another one here, then we see it there, it's going that way. They're forming that picture. After World War II, it was discovered that they could only write so fast that as more and more airplanes were present, that picture became more and more out of date. The obvious answer is you don't use people, you use a machine. As computers appear in the 1950s, they are the obvious way of keeping an up-to-date tactical picture. Modern warship is dozens of times more powerful than its World War II counterpart. The revolutionary impact of computer technology on warship operations has made this possible. The computer revolution has influenced more than weapons alone. Indeed, the computer's greatest influence may occur in the field of command and control, or as it's known in military slang, C3I. C3I is command, control, communications, and intelligence. Uh, those are all aspects of the commander's decision-making process. The input that he needs and the control that he needs to implement his decisions afterwards. C3I consists of the technological tools that a commander uses to control his forces, from the simplest field radio through to the most sophisticated computer intelligence network. Command and control is one of the least visible aspects of modern warfare, but ultimately one of the most important, and it is being deeply changed by the electronic revolution. When you look at a battle, what you see is airplanes and tanks and ships you see them firing away cheerfully. What you don't see is what makes it work. Now, someone has to decide that that airplane will go there, or that ship should go there, or, oh boy, he's massing over there, I better take care of that. That's the commander. Now, command and control is what gives him that, that picture of what's happening. Without the picture of what's happening, none of this makes much difference. If, if you go back in time, you look at a general like Napoleon. He looks at the battlefield. He sits himself on a hill, he looks down, he has some chance of seeing what's happening. As things move faster, the space involved grows enormously. There's no hill that you can sit on and see everything that's occurring. However, those individuals can talk back now. 
the ship can report where it is, the airplane, even the troops. So there's an enormous amount of information available. The question is, can the commander use any of that information? And the great development, which started in World War II actually, is the attempt to compile that information so that the commander sees what's happening right now. Then the fact that he can talk to all of these units by radio, by coded radio, allows him actually to fight the battle. That's a big difference. And if you look at the successful military organizations, what you're seeing is some effort in that direction. If you look at less successful ones, like for example the Iraqis, what you're seeing is that they, they haven't learned yet. They still think it's the tanks and the airplanes that do it all. They don't understand that without the brain behind it, it's so much expensive junk. So command and control never gets a good press. It's always sort of boring to, to, to believe, but it's terribly important, and it's important for just that reason, that it makes the thing fit together. This is a Marine Command Center during Operation Desert Storm. It is not much different in appearance from a command center in World War II, but the information flow into this command center is many times greater. Scout troops in the field radio back information on the enemy. Artillery radars wire back information on the location of enemy artillery. Combat units report on the progress of their attack. Black six, Sapper one, over. Remotely piloted vehicles radio back data on the status of enemy logistics and supply. This data flow is so great that it could require a huge and unwieldy staff. Military disaster is most often the product of confusion rather than stupidity. What is called the fog of war. Commanders are given much more information than they can understand. The information is often wildly uneven. Too much information on some subjects, not enough on others. The computer can help lift the fog of war by a process called data fusion. The data are fed into special rugged computers which can then process the material and give it back to the field commander in a way that is easy to understand. Time frame is important. Uh, amount of information are important. Both of those drive computers. Uh, the need for precision is also one of the drivers in all of this. It's all designed to help all of the commanders with the decision-making process. It's really what it comes down to. If you can provide them with the information they need in a timely manner, they'll make the right decisions. A good example of the high-tech approach to command and control is the E3A Sentry. The Sentry is better known by its acronym, AWACS, which stands for Airborne Warning and Control System. The large flying saucer dome above the aircraft houses a powerful radar. Indeed, this feature is so prominent that many people mistakenly believe that the AWACS is only an airborne radar designed to search for enemy aircraft. In fact, the AWACS also serves as an airborne command post, monitoring the location of friendly and hostile forces and directing friendly aircraft to carry out their missions. Sitting inside the AWACS are officers who direct the conduct of the air battle. They use the wealth of information from the AWACS sensors, all coordinated by the AWACS computers. As well as being a, a radar platform to give us picture information on any threat of friendly aircraft that might be out there, they uh, serve in a great capacity in terms of uh, providing us command and control and guidance for us in the air on situations that might come up and that way we can be much more flexible. Uh, we can go directly through them to the people who are making decisions and, uh, and ask them on secure communications if we need to, uh, whether or not in a particular instance we should engage or, or whether or not we're cleared to fire, for instance. And that gives us a great uh, capability and flexibility in doing that because uh, we all know the rules when we take off, but sometimes situations come up that change the, the general game plan, so this way we can be more flexible. AWACS is both the eyes and the brains of a modern airstrike. The AWACS has electronic vision far in excess of the radars on enemy fighters. So the controllers on the AWACS can alert the friendly fighters to intercept the enemy long before the enemy is within range of the friendly forces. Well, the great thing about the AWACS is uh, it uh, basically allows us to make more efficient use of the aircraft, the weapons, the fuel, the way he does that is, uh, as we're up there maybe in the combat air patrol, 
he will tell us what the picture is, or we'll ask him what's the picture. He'll say there are two groups, and he'll give us a bearing, a range, maybe an altitude if he can. Um, this allows us to know right away, before we even turn around and look, where to look, where to put our radars, where to think about uh, employing the aircraft, and uh, it saves us a tremendous amount of time. AWACS provided a critical advantage to Allied Air Forces during Operation Desert Storm. Several AWACS aircraft were airborne at all times, monitoring Iraqi airspace. Any Iraqi aircraft threatened an Allied aircraft, the AWACS could vector a friendly fighter to deal with the threat. The Iraqi fighters were blind. The coalition aircraft knew the status and location of every Iraqi aircraft that was in the air. As a result, not a single Allied aircraft was lost to Iraqi fighters, while over 30 Iraqi fighters were shot down. AWACS is not only the eyes of the airborne operation, it is the brains as well. Electronics are changing the face of modern combat technology. The ultimate objective is to make every fighter pilot an ace, every officer a great commander, every ship's captain a master of the sea. As computer power continues to increase, electronics will continue to reinforce the battle brain. Firepower, the world's largest and most complete video cassette series on contemporary military technology. There are many more titles in this series which you can order now. If you want the latest in today's advanced weapon systems in the air, on land, and at sea, look no further. For program titles and information on how to order, call us at 1-800-377-7773 and get Firepower.